Well, good morning, everyone. Um, first, a story to begin the, today. So it's a Tuesday morning at my house. It's 7.46 a.m. And I've just pulled into my garage from the gym. I'm beginning what might as well be an hour and a half of what I would equate to sprinting a half marathon, also known as just getting everyone out the door for the day. So I barely caught my breath as I see the door into my house from the garage is cracked open and an angry little blonde girl who resembles me in far too many ways that I would like to admit is staring out at me. Uh, One hand is on her hip and the other one is flailing, demanding that I move faster and come to her beckoning call. I can tell by the look on her face, uh, we have an emergency. Yes, she's only been awake for approximately 22 minutes, but already an SOS is on my hands. What might you ask is the problem? That's a great question. Did the dog run away? Is someone hurt? Is something on fire? Did we forget to do last night's homework? No, no, no. In fact, none of the above. I invite you into the saga of my life, which I have now titled the Daily Drama Hair Edition, episode 234. What could possibly be wrong? The hair decision, we have coined it in my home, uh, was planned and prepped the night before. It was a debate. It was a lengthy discussion. The 20-minute YouTube step-by-step double Dutch braid tutorial video was viewed by me. The braid was executed once again by me. Although we had a few tears, we nearly lost a finger, that would be mine. We definitely lost sanity, that's also mine. All was well when the beloved bedtime occurred. Parents, you know what I mean. But little did we know that the braids would not hold up to said blonde hair child's expectations after what appeared to be a haphazard night's sleep, resulting in some loose little strands of hair coming out of the braid. The result? Fury. I mean, appalled. Couldn't possibly in one million years be seen by the bus driver, let alone appear. You may be wondering, and somehow the list's little girl has never been more convinced it is all my fault. Yep. This was made very obvious through many, many retellings of what must have gone wrong and how little hairspray was used compared to what was needed, how one side is lopsided and one looks better than the other. This precious little tornado of a human being turned to me after many other quick fixes were utilized and after ignoring my argument that not only myself, but also two other children need to get ready for the day after all the world does not revolve around her hair. And in this valley girl tone, if you can just imagine it, she asked me this question. It kind of make my bones chill. She said, mom, I said, excuse me, could you actually try a little bit harder today? And I looked at her and I smacked her. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't smack my kid. I really wanted to. I stared with her with now my hand on my hip. Honestly, just total bewildered and shocked, but absolutely amazed, this little human. She had me right where she wanted me to be. I was caught absolutely speechless. Welcome to Parenting Week 2. Today, you are hearing from the experts. Oh, kids, oh my. There are so many moments as parents, if you're anything like me, where you kind of feel like you have no clue what you're doing, or you feel very ill-equipped to feel uh, to handle what you've been thrown. I'll never forget my husband and I barely being into our 20s, and we lugged up our uh, car seat, which contained our first daughter in it, up third uh, flights of stairs into our third story, one-bedroom condo. And I'll never forget sitting that car seat down in the middle of our living room, and then the two of us sat down on the couch, there was a moment of silence and we looked at each other and we said, so, so, so what do we do now? If you, as a parent in this room, have ever asked yourself that question or one like it once time, one time in your parenting years, or if you're not a parent, 
but you've been out maybe in public and you've seen a parent and a child having some type of situation and you're like, ooh, I wonder what they're going to do with that right now. Well, today you are in the right place. Proverbs 4, 7 says this, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. It's pretty clear. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. James, the brother of Jesus, wrote these words, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done and the humility that comes from wisdom. So this series uh, spun from a book by Andy and Sandra Stanley right here. It's called Parenting, Getting It Right. And three of us on this team, we started to read this book and we were captivated by the words of this book and how wise these words are. Andy Stanley is uh, the founding pastor, one of the most influential churches in America called North Point Community Church in the Atlanta area. And Andy is also the son of Dr. Charles Stanley. He's one of the most renowned faith leaders and pastors of our time. Many of you may be familiar with his teachings. Uh, His impact is hard to articulate. And Dr. Charles Stanley just passed away this past week at 90 years old. And uh, Andy shared a post and wrote some words about his dad. And he said this. He said, these final few weeks with my dad have been precious beyond words. At the end of every visit, he asked me to pray for him, which of course I did. On my knees beside the big leather chair he has been confined to, for the past several months. But as I was leaving his house this past Saturday night, he asked if he could pray for me, as if he knew. Then, as was his habit, he said, I couldn't be prouder of you, Andy. Andy then writes these words. He says, the source of a word determines its weight. Those are wonderful, weighty words and his final words to me. Andy is a masterful writer, communicator, preacher, and leader. And we here at this church, our team, we've been so impacted by his words and his ministry. And his words have led so many people to the person of Jesus. And Andy, just like his father, is someone whose words carry quite a bit of weight. And when we read this book, we sensed that. We said, man, these words are wise. You could say that the Stanleys have gained, as James writes about, wisdom and understanding. And it is displayed through their life and deeds, through their words, and through their experiences with parenting. And they carry a lot of weight. And the beginning of wisdom, as Proverbs says, is what? It's just to go get it, to seek after it. And so today, uh, I'm going to share quite a few words with you. We believe at this church, if you can't tell, in the power of words. We believe that they can change hearts and that they can change minds and that the deep impact of words, they can be generational. And so today, with quite a few words that are influenced by the legacy and the wisdom of the Stanleys, I'm going to pick up where Joel left off last week. And so please go back. You need to listen to week one if you missed it, because what Joel taught that resonated with me so, so deeply uh, when I read this book was the articulation around having a goal for parenting. I realized that in 11 years of parenting our three kids, my husband and I had never really sat down and had a conversation about what our goal in parenting is. Sure, we've, you know, thrown around and talked about parenting tactics. We've blindly judged other parents, and we've claimed profusely, oh, we will do that, but we won't do this. But with true intentionality, we had never sat down and asked the question, you know, what is our it, or what is our goal when it comes to parenting? Joel shared last week that the goal for parenting is different than the outcomes or goals we have for our kids, such as, you know, wanting our kids to be safe, or successful, or kind, or obedient, or even Christians. These are great goals for our kids, and we should all have them. But the Stanleys, they created a strategy for how they parented, and the goal had the end in mind. It had the weight of when they were grown and gone, what do we hope for, and what do we pray for? And it was this right here. 
Their parenting goal was kids who enjoy being with us and with each other, even when they no longer have to be. So their it in parenting was relational. It was their kids choosing to be with them when they leave the nest, they choose to come back. Words are weighty. And when I read that phrase, those words in the, in the book, I was so moved. It just hit this nerve within me. It's such a profound fa- phrase, and it stuck out to me because I thought, you know what? I so badly, as a parent, want to get it right. In a lot of days, you know, you go through parenting, you don't know if you're really getting much of anything right. But I thought, what if I could parent in a way that leads to it? And what if I could learn tools along the way to be able to do it? What else could be more worth my time as a parent? And we believe this goal, not only is it incredible, we believe it's godly. Because the heart of our God is relational. In pursuit of us, you could say, was his it. And so we as a team and as leaders are taking our cues from this book and we are claiming this goal as our parenting as well. Now, maybe this isn't your it and that's okay. Maybe you already have one, but either way, we believe within this framework, so much wisdom and so much value in our parenting strategies can be gained. And so today, here is my heart for us. I'm gonna bombard us a little bit. You can call it a word vomit, say it whatever you want. I'm gonna say a lot of words that are influenced by words that I believe carry a lot of wisdom. Um, Today, I'm going to teach. And I hope I have some note takers in the room. I see some notebooks. You are my people, okay? Get your notes out because um, you have to go and read this book. I'm gonna quickly cover all of it. You'll get so much if you read the book. But I'm gonna give us today a bunch of, of different utensils, hence my, my kitchen utensils up here. Um, these are pretty cute, aren't they? Amazon, okay? I don't know why we say that. I, do you guys catch yourself doing that? Like you, someone's like, hey, I like your shirt, and you're like, Amazon. Like it's like a response that we should say. That these legit are from Amazon though. But anyways, um, just like my husband proclaimed when I recently bought these, he said we don't really need these. I beg to differ, okay? These right here are going to help us with the how. As Joel started last week, the analogy, if we're going to make a roast, we better know how to make the roast. And so we better, if we make this goal, relationship, well, we better know how to do it. And so today, that's what we're going to do. If I'm given a goal, I like to be told how to accomplish it. And so today is that. For some of you, you know, depending on the stage you're in and the phase you're in, You may not need all these utensils. You may be sitting here and going, you know, I'm kind of, I'm out of the slotted spoon phase, Carmen. Well, good for you. I know if I'm trying to flip a burger, I don't necessarily need the slotted spoon, but I might need it someday. And it's a great utensil to have. And maybe I need it for a different dynamic and a different relationship. That's how cool some of these concepts are that I'm going to share with you today is how much they transcend. They can seep into every relationship we have. And so if you are a parent in the room, if you want to be a parent, or if you have a parent, then today's for you. And my heart is to get into the tactical, practical role because I believe getting it right matters so, so much, matters so much. So we better know how to do it. So I'm going to lay out today two guiding principles, all right? These are foundational in viewing parenting through a relational lens. And then I'm going to share a tool that served as a roadmap that the Stanleys used and it aided them in building relationships with their kids called the four stages of parenting. This utensil ended up uh, really dramatically shaping the way that they parented and kind of provides this framework as our kids grow up and move on from one stage to the next. And again, this is all of this, all these utensils are to help us towards the goal of relationship. But we need some tools, we need some utensils in order to make something great. And so here we go. I hope we are ready today to gain some understanding, to gain some wisdom. And I am here with you today. I am here to be a student Uh, I want to lean in with you, not above you, but right next to you, into one of the most profound roles we have. And so it's an honor to be here with you and learn together today. And the first principle, as we kind of set the foundation, 
is principle number one. And this centers around the idea of discipline. If you are in the zero to 18 years, you have a kid, raise your hand. Yeah, do you ever think about how much of that time in those years you dedicate towards discipline and correcting? Some days I feel like it's all I do. (laughs) Infinite amounts, right? When I started to read this book, I immediately thought, okay, how is relationship as the goal going to play out when I, seriously, I just need my kids to stop hitting each other or, you know, I need them to just go feed the dog that they profusely begged for the first time I ask. What a concept, right? As we know, discipline happens at every phase of our parenting. And uh, I heard this recently and I couldn't agree more. Discipline never comes at convenient times. I get an amen. I mean, that is just the truth. My kids seemingly, they have this way of behaving the worst they possibly can when everything in my world is already chaos. This principle though is so impactful. And to illustrate how relationship, we keep it at the forefront of discipline, the Stanleys share the story. Uh, One night, um, Andy and Sandra had gone out to dinner and they had a babysitter over. And this was a babysitter they had often. And they got home that night and they uh, expected to hear the typical response from the sitter that everything went great and their three kids behaved well. And that night, she told them that their two boys which were ages uh, about eight and 10 at the time, had been difficult and really disrespectful to her. And so the next morning, uh, Mama Sandra, she woke the boys up earlier than normal. And uh, she made them sit down and write apology notes to the babysitter. And then she told them they needed to go get dressed in some nice clothes, get money out of their spending jars and meet her in the car. Oh boy, they had no idea what was going on. And then she let them in on her plan. They were going to go to the grocery store and pick out flowers for the babysitter that they would pay for with their own money. And then they were gonna drive to where the babysitter worked and walk into her office with their notes, with their flowers and hand deliver not only that to them, but also an apology to her face. They were horrified as you can expect. But this is so brilliant in achieving principle number one, and that is that the goal of discipline is to teach your child how to restore the relationship they damaged. So good. You know, maybe you've never really stopped to think about a goal for discipline other than some type of behavior modification. And think about it this way. If there's no discipline goal, there's probably no discipline. Sure, there might be, you know, punishment. I love punishment or consequence. But discipline makes a person better while punishment rarely does. Punishment has this message. Uh, If you don't obey me, then bad things will happen to you. Instead, if we make our parenting goal relational, then at the heart of every transgression is a someone, not a something. Instead of just taking away something, the focus on making things right with the people we've wronged is brilliant and biblical. The Stanleys teach a two-word response uh, when children misbehave. Think of it as like the best spatula you got, okay? So I'm sure you have a lot of words that you might say when your kids do something, but the phrase that Andy used when their kids did something wrong was this right here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, our typical responses are probably, number one, something that I can't repeat on stage today. Number two, uh, some version of, you know better than that. Or number three, a longer version of our child's name. We just love to elongate our children's names for emphasis. Now, these responses, though, put you and your child on opposing teams. Oh no, instead, is a way of siding with your child. It's a way of saying, we, you and I, are so sorry that you did that because now you're going to have to face the consequence. It's relationship focused. Then he teaches this guide, this is so helpful, um, for how to say sorry. If we even did this as adults, I promise you, we would have less conflict in our lives and Facebook would be a more enjoyable platform to get on occasionally, okay? 
So the first thing he says is that we need to require our children to apologize in a complete sentence. How good is that? He says, sorry alone is not a complete sentence. Always include the pronoun and include the offense, such as I'm sorry I lied to you. Or yesterday I had to ask one of my children to say to their sibling, I'm sorry I hit you with that bat. Mm -hmm, That was fun. (laughs) Number two, it says uh, that we should apologize to everyone affected by their action. This is so key. Even if the offense wasn't done to everyone, parents in the room, you know that typically like there was a little tidal wave that just came in, right? More people are typically affected. And so instead of just, uh, just saying sorry to who you did it to, no, no, you need to say sorry to whoever was affected by it. The third thing he teaches is to leverage the apology for maximum impact. That's why they went to the babysitter's office to make eye contact, to make it face-to-face. And then finally, every apology follows up with restitution, this goal of making the relationships right. And so this question follows every apology, and it's this, is there anything I can do to make it up to you? This is brilliant. Now, I am not suggesting you use this guide when a two-year-old chucks a toy across the room. Now, Billy, we need to sit down and say, I'm, okay? No, that's not effective. But uh, this utensil should influence the way we see discipline at every single phase and how to keep it relational. I understand this is not the convenient way to discipline, and it is not also the fastest way. But I believe it is such a godly way to image the heart of our Creator, who has a desire for a right relationship with us, and so teaching our kids how to restore relationships so they'll know how to do it in the future is so great. The second principle in this book, uh, this is probably the most impactful thing for me that I took away from this book. As mentioned, there are these four stages of parenting that Angie and Sandra define that kind of guided them and was this key utensil in helping them keep relationship the goal. And these are also fairly intuitive. So here they are, the four stages of parenting. So first we have the discipline years, and I'm going to run through these in a minute, but they're zero to five years old. Then we have the training years, five to 12, the coaching years, and then finally followed up by the friendship years. Now these, when you look at them, you're like, yeah, those seem pretty obvious, right? But the next guiding principle may not be so obvious, and it is this right here. Principle number two is that kids move from one stage to the next without thought or effort, but parents don't. Now, this utensil is so crucial. Oh, and it holds so much weight. Parents have to consciously adjust their approach as kids seamlessly transition through stages. The magnitude of this rule is everything because we have all witnessed parents who either never adjust their approach even though their kid has moved on to the next phase or they fall behind and they're forced to play catch up. Um, We've all seen the parent who is stuck in the discipline phase on the sideline of their middle schooler's baseball game. I mean, you know, you, you can picture it in your mind now. And instead of adjusting to the coaching phase, when a mistake is made by their 12-year-old, they scold them in front of everybody like they might have when they were four years old. Or equally tragic uh, is, you know, the parent who's stuck in the coaching phase. And even though their child is grown and gone and out of the house, they view those conversations they get with them as a time to offer unsolicited advice or opinions, and they're totally missing out on that phase of friendship. Here's the problem when this is overlooked. The relationship breaks down. And if relationship is our it, if relationship is our goal, oh my gosh, we have to care about this. This is such a tragic misstep we make as parents. I think it is one of the reasons why so many adult relationships between kids and parents isn't what it's supposed to be. A phase adjustment was never made in the parent's role. And so as a result, the relationship then is forced or fractured. Here's the good news. If you're a young parent in the room, oh man, you can get this right. You really can. 
You can do things and you can know things about the phases your kids go into that will prep you for lasting relationships years and years with your kids. And then if you're a parent in the room and you go, well, might have messed up there. They're grown and gone. Well, you're here. So you still have time to make it right. You still have time to say sorry. You still have time to restore that relationship. And so lean in. So now that we have these two guiding principles, okay, these are our two critical utensils, I want to move in to the overview of the four stages of parenting and, again, help give another utensil to how we make relationship the goal and also know our role in each phase. Uh, The scriptures, they talk so much about the idea of seasons. You know, in Genesis 1, God God creates time and, and he creates seasons, And then you see the use and the metaphor of season language all throughout the scriptures. And I believe there is so much wisdom and understanding and leaning into the seasons that God has us in. You know, maybe you sit here today and you go, I can't stand God what season I'm stuck in. I feel like I'm in a rut. But I believe that God does have purpose in those seasons. The writer of Ecclesiastes 3 states, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And so these phases that I'm going to share with you, they can be viewed truly as profound seasons where we get to leverage our relationship as parents. Uh, so many older seasoned parents will come up to me, and probably you if you're a younger parent, and they remind you this. They say that the days are long, but what? The years are short. Days are long, but the years are short. And I believe this framework I'm about to share with you is so crucial in helping us not miss those days because they are long, but the years, man, they go by like that. And so this is such a helpful thing as we lean into the seasons we truly get with our kids. And so the first phase is this. It's the discipline years. Zero to five years old, we teach our child there are consequences, both good and bad, to their actions. If you remember these years... uh, so much establishing, right, of what is safe and what is okay is done. And our primary goal is to strengthen our child's obedience muscle through reps. It is so crucial in this phase that we start to establish the relational groundwork that you as the parent, that me as the parent, are the main disciplinary. Because think about it this way. Someone will discipline your kids, It can be us, it can be the parent when the stakes are a little lower in these years, or later it can be a teacher, a principal, a coach, some type of authority figure. One thing Sandra, she writes about that is so helpful in understanding is that children will do childish things. I think you know that if you're here. So in this phase, uh, we need to identify when is the time to spend energy disciplining. And they were given something called the three Ds from parents who were a phase ahead of them. And these three Ds dictated when discipline would immediately happen. It's really, really important to note, these are relational Ds. Why? Because the goal is relationship. So this is such a great utensil. So the three Ds are disobedience, dishonesty, and disrespect. So when one of these occurred, uh, immediate discipline would happen. And also, when the opposite of these occurred, when their children, uh, you know, were obeying or being honest or respectful, they would celebrate like crazy because they knew this, that what is rewarded gets repeated. And so starting early with this will only pay off for years to come, but the major focus are relational consequences for both good and bad behavior. You know, these years, zero to five, uh, they are arguably, or probably not even arguably, they are the most exhausting. But in many ways, they are the sweetest years that you have. And so many moments that feel insignificant can in fact be the opposite. Because our discipline can start to model a life of discipleship. Author of a great book that's titled um, Habits of the Household, he shares and writes that discipline is the process that creates disciples, that scripture shows us that one of the ways in which God loves us back into relationship with him was through discipline. He pursues us despite our mess ups. He establishes, you know, rules for us that set us apart. It's what he did with the Israelites 
And, and he asks us to follow them, but still, despite it all, what does he do? He chooses to love us back into relationship with him. You know, when we start to establish this role as parents in these little years, this is what we are modeling to our kids. Thankfully then, though, we start to move out of the discipline heavy years. And instead of saying just the do's and the don'ts, we move into the training years, the training years, five to 12 years old. And we explain the why behind rules and expectations. So these are the years we tell our kids what to do and also explain why it's important. So there's still consequences, of course. Um, but there's a lot more, as Sandra calls it, explaining to the training. Instead of telling them simply, hey, don't go ride your bike into the road, uh, you start to tell them why. You start to train them and uh, teach them to look both ways and teach them how to ride on one side of the road instead of the middle. My three kids right now are 11 years old, almost nine and six. And so, yep, I am like smack dab in the middle of the training years. In order to master this phase, which uh, I have not, that is very clear. Please refer to intro story. Um, one thing is crucial and it's the word practice because practice makes what? No, it doesn't make perfect, you perfectionist. You just, that's, practice makes progress, okay? And so we practice all types of things. Our two daughters right now, my two uh, oldest children are currently taking piano lessons. And if you ask them if they like it, one will profusely tell you no. She also happens to be the one mentioned in the intro story. She will tell you no. She will tell you how much, in fact, she hates it. And the other one, a little more mild, she'll tell you it kind of depends on the day. To be honest, though, uh, how they feel about piano right now is besides the point for me, because this has been one of the most practical ways for my kids to learn the importance of practice and progress. We have a lesson once a week, and there are weeks that go by where 10 minutes of practice maybe in seven days is done. How do you think that lesson goes that week? Yeah, not well, not gonna lie, not well. Um, and then we have weeks where just 10 minutes a day, just 10 little minutes are put towards piano. And guess what? I'm just shocking, I know. It's actually enjoyable. Progress is made. These are the years where we do the same thing. The skills and values we want our kids to have later in life, they have to be practiced. The Stanleys said it this way. They said, the skills we want our kids to have in public, we must train for them in private. How wise is that premise alone? I love this. Think about taking this into just spiritual development. How important is it to start to establish with our kids that private disciplines are what primes us for how we act and interact and love the people and the world? And so you may ask, well, what does relationship look like as the goal in this phase? Many of the skills that we should focus on should be people-focused this is such a key utensil. For example, social skills were emphasized in these years because social skills honor who? They honor people. The Stan Stanley family practiced greetings. Uh, they practiced table manners. And they coined this phrase, which I have stolen, and you should steal it too, called the interrupt rule. Their kids had a rule that if uh, a parent was talking to someone else and the kid wanted to come and say something, Instead of interrupting them, they would put their hand on their leg when they were older. And then as they got, or as younger, and when they got older, they would put it on their arm. And this would let the parent know, okay, they would like to say something. And so when I'm done talking, I will turn to them. Why this rule? Well, because not interrupting shows respect and honor to people. And so these are the ways we start to reinforce relationship as the it before we move on to the next stage, which is the coaching years. And those are 12 to 18 years old. And these are where we connect more than correct. And we move to the sidelines for coaching. You know, this might be the hardest phase to transition to. It comes full of mood swings, and voice changes, and suddenly mom and dad, you are viewed as like the dumbest person in the room who knows nothing at all about anything. Sandra writes that, it's a weird time where there seems to be cravings for privacy and independence, a cocktail of hormones, and a newfound insecurity. 
These all swirl together and deliver a bite when you least expect it. I am pretty sure this is accurate to how my parents would describe me in these years. The transition, though, from the training to the coaching, it might be the most crucial because allowing our kids the ability to start to make decisions on their own, it lays the groundwork, it lays the foundation for the next season to come, the one where you and I as parents, we won't be there. And so therefore, the how, the utensil of this phase, it's connection. And to keep your kids coming back to you for guidance and support. It is quite literally to stand on the sidelines, to cheer them on and give some instructions, but really to hang back, letting them gain personal momentum. Uh, Sandra shared in this phase how connecting over correcting was a hard adjustment for her to make. Why? Because she loves to correct. Do I have any other correcting fans in the room, right? It's hard to do this. And so they came up with these three concepts. These are these three utensils are awesome. Imagine them as like the whisk. Who doesn't love a good whisk, okay? And uh, these help us make relationship the priority and care about connecting. And the first one is this. It's to cultivate constant conversations. Cultivate constant conversations. So my oldest daughter, she is nearing this phase. It's hard to believe. She's almost right there. And so this thing is one, uh, this is one of those things I'm practicing right now with her. And that's just the art of making space for her, both figuratively and literally. This is the phase where our kids really start to open up and share things with us. Um, but you know, no one wants a 20 question quiz when they walk into the door, including my husband. I've learned this through the years. And so one of the things I'm doing right now with her is I'm just trying to hold space for her so that the relationship is magnified. I try to make a daily effort of one-on-one -on -one time and space with me. And when I do, sometimes I ask a starting question and sometimes I don't have to say anything at all. Allowing her space it sends this message to her that, hey, you are safe with me and I want to be with you. I desire to be with you right now. Typically, uh, this is as simple as saying, hey, let's go on a walk to get the mail or let's run to Kroger really quick. And that allows her space. And I hardly say anything. Instead, I listen. If all I do is ask a bunch of questions, then suddenly it becomes about what I want to hear instead of what she wants to share. I sometimes ask her if she wants my advice, but mainly I intently just look into her eyes and I just give her space. You know, lately I've learned a lot about what fifth grade girls are talking about. We'll call them the changes. <sighs> Let me tell you, I need a parenting book for that one if someone wants to hand me that. But, you know, my daughter, she keeps coming back to me, and so I keep holding space for her. If every time a kid shares, as parents we go into lecture mode, this shouldn't surprise you, but our kids will stop talking. A cool idea I heard about uh, is the concept of something called a third thing. It's a great way to cultivate conversations. And the idea is that typically conversation comes easier, happens easier around a third thing. And so a third thing, like I said, it could be a walk, it could be a bike ride, it could be throwing a football, it could be eating a snack together, it could be making a recipe. Find something that adds an enjoyment factor for kids to engage in conversations. You know, be a student of your kids. God made each of your kids, if you have multiple, he made each of them uniquely. And so one size fits all. It just doesn't work with our kids, especially how we engage and talk with them. Another way, another utensil to connect over correct is this idea, don't bail, let them fail. This is really hard as a parent, isn't it? to just like knowingly kind of watch your child fail at times. But bailing our kids out every time, it hurts way more in the long run than it helps. And so this can look like, you know, not rushing that thing that your kid left at home after you had repeatedly told them to not forget it at school and they still left it. Just thinking, okay, they're going to figure this out. Or it could look like uh, not calling that other mom who's your friend because you know both your daughters are fighting. Instead, you say, you know what? I'm going to let them figure this one out. There are natural consequences that our kids need to experience. 
And our role as mom and dad is to guide and encourage them through that experience, but not to deprive them of the chances to learn from it. Lastly, Andy talks about how to connect over correct, and it's to get interested in what interests them. You know, whether it might be something that interests you or not, there are few better ways to express your love and foster connection with your child than doing this. Coach their sport. Uh, learn their hobby. Engage in it in every way you can. Make sure it's genuine, right? Make sure it's their interest, not ours, because think about all that's missed when we try to push our agenda on our kids rather than letting them develop it on their own. Figure out what just lights your kid up, you know, and learn it, invest in it, care about it, and watch what it does to foster and develop your relationship. My little, uh, he's six, he, so he's out of this phase, but this, these all transcend. He loves hockey right now. And I, I, I just, I know there's hockey fans in here because Columbus Blue Jackets and it's great, but like, I don't love hockey. And I have sat through many YouTube videos and learned many hockey players' names. And we are, I mean, we are bonding over this. It's just one way right now that I can foster connection with him. So we've disciplined parents, we've trained, we've coached, and now congrats, we're done parenting. Just kidding, we're not. We got one more phase, and this is called the friendship years. And in this uh, phase, our relationship is increasingly free to be a friendship. And we engage and connect as adults who enjoy each other's company. In this phase, parents, you ramp up to dial back and hopefully, hopefully you reap the rewards of all that sweat equity in those hands-on phases. Andy and Sandra share a story in this section that their kids were asked to go to dinner with some of their team uh, to develop content and stories for this book. And within 24 hours of the dinner being over, all three of their kids had reached out to them and told them how much they enjoyed spending time together. So much so that after the dinner, they, the three of them went and they kept hanging out. And they each expressed how life-giving it was. You know, that is it. That's when you know the goal has been met. You know, parenting uh, doesn't end in this phase. And any parent who's walking through these years, well, you know that. But the hope is that the groundwork has been set and that the choice to engage gets made. You know, uh, my parents made relationship a goal, if not the goal, before a really cool book was written about it. And I know there are many, many parents, I'm staring out at them, uh, who did this as well. Great work. And you know, one of the most critical ways my parents did this was in this phase, they chose to still pursue us as adult children, despite our mess ups. You know, there's four kids and even as adults, man, we made our mistakes. And my parents in these years have chosen to stand, you know, next to us instead of across from us. You know, my relationship with my parents, the word I would use to describe it, one of them is the word free. Free. You know, I cannot understate the importance of giving this to your kids. I feel really no strings attached. I feel no expectations. Heavy expectations to an adult child would will just send them in the opposite direction. Instead, I feel free to pursue a true friendship with my mom and dad. And so I do, and I choose to do it. I talk to my mom who is uh, stayed away almost every single day. Every single day, I call her actually. And I'm one of four. So in the morning, like it's, it's part of my morning like ritual. I drink my coffee and I go to the gym and I get ready and I call my mom. And that's just part of what we do. All four of us, we're all calling mom. It's hard to get in. Someone's on the phone with mom. Get off the phone with mom. I want to talk to mom. 
But you know, I, I'm 30 plus years old and I choose to do that because I want to. I want to call her. She's a great listener. She's a great friend and she's the best advice giver. And so in these years, developing a true friendship with your kids, oh, it is a treasure for both of you. Andy talks about how in this phase, uh, he, he had a phrase that approaches everything. The way in which you talk is everything in this phase. And to close, he shares a story. He, uh, he was sitting down with his son who was getting ready to go off to college and he had no idea what he wanted to major in. And so Andy sat down with him and he asked him this question. Listen, listen to the way he says this. He says, Andrew, until you know what to do, will you allow me and will you trust me to give you some direction? Do you hear how relational that approach is? He asked permission to give advice. He doesn't just throw it on him. And Andy suggested that his son major in finance. And so he did for four years. He went to college and majored in finance, got a great job right out of school and was working. And then uh, he decided pretty quickly out of college that he wanted to do stand-up comedy full-time. Quite the left turn. Andy describes how they had the talk. And he said to him, hey, look, son, I didn't pay out-of-state tuition for four years for you to go and blow whatever on some job that won't pay the bills. No, he didn't say that. He said his responsibility wasn't to decide what his son does with his life. Instead, his responsibility was to put his weight behind what he decides to do with his life. So that's exactly what he did. As parents, we surely won't get it right every time, but it is critical to understand our role. My hope and prayer is that today you, you gained a utensil. You know, you walk out with a spoon or a whisk, not mine. You, can't, you can go to Amazon and get these, but that helps you, that leads you into figuring out how to make it the goal of parenting because we think it's so, so beautiful. You know, when you think about God uh, as our Father, He chose us. You know, He chose relationship with us. And what a beautiful goal to emulate that and to make that our goal, right? The, the most intimate people in our lives, our family, our kids, they choose us and we choose them. It's quite the goal, isn't it? It's quite the it. And so I wonder if we start to view these seasons as significant as they are, the influence that could happen in them. Because as we know, and as any parent who's a little older likes to remind me, the season you're in, guess what? It won't be like this for long. If you know me, I, I am fully confident and believe that there is a country song for every single life experience we go through. <laughs> and so Chris and Daniel are going to come out right now, and they're going to sing a song. And it's, it's, gonna, it's, it's really good. I'm going to warn you. It's probably going to make you cry. And you know, despite how much energy I'm spending right now on hair discussions with my eight-year-old, I know that she won't always care to discuss it with me. Thank goodness. But I better enjoy it while I can. And so what phase are you in? What season are you in? How can you lean into it? Because I promise you this, it will not be like this for long. somewhat unfair, but happy Sunday. Let's pray real quick. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you, God, that you are, you're just a great father, and you love us, and you chose us, and you chose relationship with us. And God, I pray today that uh, the parents in this room, we would be stirred to emulate that and to move towards that with our kids. God, that we would view this time with them as precious and unique. And God, I pray that you would help us with the tools. You would help soften our hearts and stir our hearts to just lean into, God, what they need. God, put our pride aside, put what we want aside, and lean in and maximize the influence that we have with these precious people that you've given us, God, that are a gift. And God, I pray for uh, just the hardship in the room, the broken hearts, the relationships that aren't perfect and, and don't feel good. 
God, we know that you're a God of restoration and you, you are a God that restores and redeems things. And I pray that today, maybe someone would take a step towards that. It would take a step towards that moment, what it looks like to redeem a relationship so that the years they have, they can count. God, we love you. I thank you for the families of this church. And God, I pray a blessing on them right now. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, Don't forget to join us next week. Ryan Donovan is going to help us figure out how to be as parents, how to deal with our souls so we can be the best parents. Have a good Sunday, guys. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We want to connect with you. So go ahead and text that number on your screen uh, and somebody will reach out. We want to get to know you and your story a little bit more. Uh, We hope you have a great week and we will see you next time.